so uh, the next thing I want to do is I want to acknowledge, of course, that we are on First Nations land, and I want to um, us to be conscious of that for this talk tonight in particular, and that what I'm talking about tonight, the spirituality that I practice, the witchcraft that I practice, comes from a history of um, marginalized people that have spoken up. And so in solidarity with First Nations people who are speaking up, I want us to be aware of where we sit tonight. <clears throat> called Blessing for the Earth Healers. We give thanks for all those who are moved in their lives to heal and protect the earth in small ways and in large. Blessings on the composters, the gardeners, the breeders of worms and mushrooms, the soil builders, those who cleanse the waters and purify the air, all those who clean up the messes others have made. Blessings on those who defend trees and who plant trees who guard the forests and who renew the forests. Blessings on those who learn to heal the grasslands and renew the streams, on those who prevent erosion, who restore the salmon and the fisheries, who guard the healing herbs and who know the lore of the wild plants. Blessings on those who heal the cities and bring them alive again with excitement and creativity and love. Gratitude and blessings to all who stand against greed, who risk themselves, to those who have bled and been wounded, and to those who have given their lives in service of the earth. May all the healers of the earth find their own healing. May they be fueled by passionate love for the earth. May they know their fear but not be stopped by fear. May they feel their anger and yet not be ruled by rage. May they honor their grief, but not be paralyzed by sorrow. May they transform fear, rage, and grief into compassion and the inspiration to act in service of what they love. May they find the help, the resources, the courage, the luck, the strength, the love, the health, the joy that they need to do the work. May they be in the right place, at the right time, in the right way. May they bring alive a great awakening, open a listening ear to hear the earth's voice, transform imbalance to balance, hate and greed to love. Blessed be the healers of the earth. So, my name is Lorena and I'm a witch, and I'm an animal rights activist, and I'm proud of both. Um, and I really thank you for coming today and hearing this. This is not um, an academic talk. This is not a talk filled with technology. This is about combining the, the body and mind and heart, which I know as animal activists we do on a regular basis. So tonight I just want to share a little bit about what I've learned garnered over the years and over the various teachers that I've been fortunate enough to work with. Um, I really work better interactively, so to be sort of at my head here is a bit weird for me. So um, I don't view myself as an expert. I am someone who's sort of listening to my own calling and um, applying it to be of service, especially for non-human animals. So that's why I'm here, and I feel really grateful to have been asked to talk a little bit about this. So my books are my like security blanket. Um, so I will be referencing some books, um, some of them coming from an academic perspective, and some of them all coming from um, a more spiritual basis. Is everyone okay just to go around and say their name? Um, and if you're not, you can pass. So. Peter McQueen. And 
Jenny. Okay. We'll be back. We'll be back. Helen. I'm Leslie. Jill. Oh. Paul. Pete. Enza. And Allison. Tracy. Yeah. Paul. Good. Thank you. Um, so, my relationship to witchcraft and to animal rights and to feminism and to Starhawk is what I read from. This is a book called um, The Earth Path, Grounding Your Spirit in the Rhythms of Nature. Um, my relationship to all of those things have been um, about filling in gaps. So, um, I kind of, I still consider myself a seeker in life, always will. And my journey to both witchcraft and feminism kind of started at the same time. I think my journey with my connection to non-human animals has been there forever. Um, I just didn't have the language for it initially. And my relationship with Starhawk started a little bit after that feminism witchcraft thing. So I was living in Halifax, a little bit of context about me, in the 80s. Um, and I had left a, another, I left Winnipeg um, for various reasons and ended up there and I was in the only co-op bookstore there called Red Herring and just searching, just not knowing what was next in my life. It was one of those crossroad times and a book fell, literally fell off the shelf at my feet and it was red and it was the first edition of Starhawks Dreaming the Dark and actually no it wasn't Dreaming the Dark, it was the next book she wrote. Um, and I picked it up and looked at it, and it said, you know, witchcraft. It had the symbols, and I was like, what is this? So, but I bought it. I had no idea what it was, but I bought it. And I took it home, and it sat on the shelf for two years. And then one day, it felt really right to just pull it out again, and I started reading it. And I was incredibly struck by how it touched me. By that time I was in university studying, at that time it was called women's studies, so I was full of anger. <laughs> so it was a really good time to have found this book that was talking about um, our affective journeys in life, our emotional components in life, and how we can work with that to um, bring change. And it was all kind of filling together for me at that point. Um, the animal rights question came about two years later. I, I shouldn't say came, it reemerged about a few years later. And when I talk about my journey of gaps, it really is that. Um, while I was studying feminism, I was noticing gaps about um, injustices for other people and for animals. While I was studying witchcraft, I was noticing the gaps about nature being constructed as an it, and oftentimes nature not talking about the non-human animals that we use in our daily lives. So there was a gap for me in what I was also reading. Um, around witchcraft and how that could apply and affect social change. There was a gap in the animal rights literature I was reading because there wasn't, uh, uh, at that time for me, an intersection of spirituality in me and anything. It was very theoretical, it was very political, and I, and I needed it and I loved it, but there was a gap. Then I got to work with Starhawk in the late 80s and I went to what were called witch camps in the U.S. to learn from her. So she became my teacher and I kind of laugh, I never got to go to camp as a kid, so my first camps were witch camps <laughs> in my, you know, 20s. So, <clears throat> and I noticed a gap in Starhawk and it's really hard when you kind of admire your teachers and you're like, oh my god, this is amazing. And then 
you start to see, and the mistake of putting anything or anyone on a pedestal, you start to see, oh, nothing's perfect. So the gap in all of this, then, was about the absence of non-human animals as beings. And that gap started to kind of overtake everything else in terms of my sort of political work and my spiritual development. <clears throat> so I believe in acknowledging the teachers. Even when we grow from them, I believe in acknowledging them because we're all in this journey together, hopefully. Um, and sometimes we part and that's okay. So she was my first real, I was maybe not my first, but one of the most significant um, spiritual teachers that I've ever had. And what I loved about her and her Reclaiming Collective, which came out of California, was their attention to the issue of social justice. Um, even though there was the gap of the non-human animal piece, and initially the gap of really looking at racialized and classed people too. So, since then, I think their collective has really grown in terms of being more inclusive around other social justice issues. Yet, the non-human animal question is not there yet. What I noticed in the whole... Then I started to research and learn more about other traditions of witchcraft and... <coughs> the idea that we are all interconnected we're interconnected to nature, and nature informs us, and we in turn inform nature, is part of a conundrum that I find. And <clears throat> that conundrum then ties into the feminism, the, the, the issues that I, I, I struggle with in feminism around, and in eco-feminism in particular, around this connection that is often talked about between women and nature, um, and what that means. So I think while we need to start somewhere, I think it's really important to also think critically about what the implications of that are. So when I call it a conundrum, that's what it is. Because I so connect with the idea that as women in particular, um, we understand cycles maybe in a little, in, in a way that can be different for us, uh, for, for men in particular. Yet, if we move solely down that track, we move into the the realm of essentializing and, and creating binaries. And I think binaries can be troublesome. So whether it's, you know, woman nature, um, men culture, um, women passive, male aggression, um, binaries can move us into areas that I think we can get stuck in. So. I have this relationship with ecofeminism that um, at times I feel so connected to and other times I feel troubled by. Yes. I want to read from, does, has anyone read this book yet? It's a book called um, Women in the Animal Rights Movement, as you can see I've been reading it. Um, but this is Joanne MacArthur's copy, so I couldn't actually write in it. I usually love to write in books, so I have little tags. This is by a woman named Emily Garter. And I love it because she does look at the issue of gender in, um, in the animal rights movement. So this is what she's talking about in relation to ecofeminism. So, Ecofeminism argues that feminism must engage with the ethics of animal status and treatment because all oppressions are interconnected. Greta Gard argues for the importance of revealing the interconnections among numerous forms of oppression in order to expose the structure and functioning of hierarchy itself. As, articu as articulated by Carol Adams, 
This stance asserts that a progressive anti-racist defense of animals locates itself at the point of intersection of race, class, sex, and species. Furthermore, feminist defenses of animals refuse complicity with body-denying policies and actions and honor connections. And that's Carol Adams, a quote from Carol Adams. While there is no unified body of work or perspective that could be called ecofeminism, ecofeminists generally believe there are important connections between the oppression of women and that of non-human life forms such as animals and the environment. Ecofeminist thought outlines the conceptual links in patri patriarchal thought that identify women as closer to nature and men as closer to culture. Societies that see nature as inferior to culture, most Western societies, devalue and oppress persons and groups identified with nature. These dualisms serve to justify the domination of women, animals, and the earth. And that's by women, Carol and Merchant. So ultimately, Carol Adams sums it up that sexism and racism are embedded in animal comparisons and imagery. And that I don't doubt. It's the binaries that get to me. So that's where my confliction around this connection between women and nature starts. And yet, when I'm in nature, I so feel it. So what to do about that? So in the reclaiming tradition, <clears throat> Starhawk writes about witchcraft in this way. Our magical practices arose from people who were deeply connected to the natural world, and our rituals were designed to give back to that world, to help maintain its balance along with our human balance. If we leave the natural world out of our practice and rituals in any real sense, if we invoke an abstract earth, but never have any real dirt under our fingernails, our spiritual, psychic, and physical health becomes devitalized and deeply unbalanced. To be a witch, a practitioner of the old religion of the goddess, or a pagan, someone who practices an earth-based spiritual tradition, is more than adopting a new set of terms and customs and a wardrobe of flowing gowns. It is to enter a different universe, a world that is alive and dynamic where everything is part of an interconnected whole, where everything is always speaking to us if only we have our ears to listen. A witch must not only be familiar with the mystic planes of existence beyond the physical realm, she should also be familiar with the trees and the plants and the birds and the animals of her own backyard, be able to name them, know their uses and habits and what part each plays in the whole. She should understand not just the symbolic aspects of the moon cycle, but the real functioning of the Earth's water and mineral and energy cycles. She should know the importance of ritual in building human community, but also understand the function of fungi and soil microorganisms in the natural community in which human community is embedded. In fact, everybody should, she writes. Our culture is afflicted with a vast disconnection, an abyss of ignorance that becomes apparent whenever an issue involving the natural world arises. As a society, we are daily making decisions and setting policies that have enormous repercussions on the natural world, and those policies are being set by officials and approved by a public who are functionally eco-illiterate. That I agree. So, I guess when we talk about being connected and we bring it to the animal rights question, I think that's where we can find solidarity in gender. I'm not um, discounting the issues that come up even in um, in Emily Garter's book around how the animal rights movement has been constructed around leadership and gender and how that there is an imbalance. I'm talking about our hearts. So now I'm going to get into the why witchcraft part for me. 
So I call myself witch and I always have when I do that deliberately. Um, <laughs> it's a magic bell. <laughs> um, just as I call myself animal rights activist, and I know that there's lots of, and language is important, and I know that people call themselves different things for different reasons, and there's political implications behind it. So I say animal rights activist because I want non-human animals to have rights. And I say witch because by using that word, I'm taking the opportunity to jar, to make uncomfortable, in order to make otherwise for people, hopefully. So it's an educational process for me. Um, so the word witch for me connects me into a history um, and a tradition that makes sense for me. It also encompasses all of my political understanding and all of my my ways of being in the world that lead to my politics as well. So for me, that word makes sense. It doesn't for everyone. But that's why I use it. Um, so the thing about the interconnectedness between my work as an animal rights activist and that of a witch is that of empathy. So I think empathy is like rampant in our animal rights movement. And I think how it gets expressed and how it get used, gets used as a political tool is interesting and dynamic. I think where witchcraft sort of interweaves with that is about how we work with our emotions and how we give value to the role affect and emotional territory plays in our movement. I think that trope that we see often around animal rights activists as angry, as full of rage, I think that's true. I think many of us live with that. Unfortunately, it gets discounted. And that's what I love about the craft, is that in the craft, we acknowledge the role emotion plays in our life, and that every emotion is valid and important. So when we are crafting ritual, for example, we acknowledge each direction, and each direction is related to an emotion, and each relax, each, each um, Direction is also, in the way I practice, related to particular non-human animals and what they bring to us and what we can offer them. So there's these different interconnections that we can utilize when we are practicing as a witch or as a pagan or as whoever we are. <laughs> in none of that. But that emotional piece is important. Um, It helps us to understand our political connections and how we can utilize energy in our movement as well. For me, being able to access the emotional space and being validated around doing that brings up the question that Judith Butler often queries in her writings, who's a feminist theorist and who, Tori, you uh, referenced numerous times, which lives are grievable? And that's what I love about the work of Judith Butler, is that she theorizes around the idea of mourning, around commemoration, and around public grief as a political act. And I think all of us who are animal rights activists, I'm just going to use that phrase, and I'm using that phrase because it makes sense to me, um, we ponder that, and we work towards that, and we question that, and we want to change that. Which bodies are grateful, which lives are grateful. So, going into those deeper emotional terrains, using practices of witchcraft, I think is a way of um, dismantling also the mind body disconnect and it's a way of harnessing our energy so that we can sustain ourselves in a movement that is really hard 
because of what is being done to the bodies of the non-human animals, those that I think we all would agree are grievable. So, there's this book called Sister Species. Has anyone ever looked at it? It's an anthology. It's a feminist anthology. And the foreword is written by Carol Adams. Um, <clears throat> There's a section, and this is actually within the introduction, and the introduction is by a woman that I wasn't familiar with. Her name is um, Lisa Kamerer, and this is a section called Empathy, Silence, Trauma, and Voice. And I love it because she starts out with a quote from Audre Lorde. Um, and this is from Audre Lorde's work called From. When I'm reading these things, I guess I would just ask that you just, just let it in and just reflect for yourself and just notice what comes up for you. So this is odd, what Audre Lorde talks about in relation to um, her political struggles. Those of us who stand outside the circle of this society's definition of acceptable women, those of us who have been forged into the crucibles of difference, those of us who are poor, who are lesbians, who are black, who are older, know that survival is not an academic skill. It is learning how to stand alone, unpopular, and sometimes reviled and how to make common cause with those others identified as outside the structures in order to define and seek a world in which we can all flourish. It is learning how to take our differences and make them strengths. For the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. So then Lisa Kamara furthers that by saying, I have often wondered how empathic women have the courage to repeatedly expose themselves to trauma, entering animal labs, factory farms, slaughterhouses to witness and record insidious treatment of non human and I would add that that's not just a terrain for women. Uh, add anyone who enters those arenas. While maintaining a semblance of emotional and psychological equilibrium. Empathic people face misery head on. Not only to bring about much needed change, but as a means of in a world where unconscionable violence and pervasive injustices are the norm, they have come to see activism as the lesser of two miseries. These women have found that their only hope for peace of mind is to walk straight into that pervasive misery and work for change. So what happens when we walk straight into that pervasive misery? How do we manage that? And that's where my witchcraft practice comes into play for me. Um, sometimes I've worked with individual activists that have come to me when they've been in trauma because of what they're observing. And sometimes words is not the best course of action. Sometimes things become so embodied that to go to that place, you have to find different means. So that's where we might create a ritual or a, it's a different way of being. It's, it's what 
it's what can be called non-ordinary reality. And that's where we draw on the traditions of the craft in whatever tradition you've been taught. So for me, Starhawk comes from a tradition of the um, Celtic fairy tradition. So there's a particular way of working and she's in a particular way of working with the directions that you can harness that is mostly unspoken that can help release some of the trauma that some of the activists may be embodying. Um, and come to a different understanding of what walking into that misery means so that we can in turn use that knowledge and the strength maybe that we garnish in that way to continue to walk into misery and face the misery that non-human animals face. I think this is really apparent with the SAFE movement, with those of you who have gone and who bear witness to the non-human animals that are being transported into slaughter. I feel like that is a terrain that is incredibly um, ritualized for me, anyway, in that um, that walking into misery and facing it with non-human animals is like a non-ordinary reality, in that it shouldn't be ordinary. It's about calling out that which has become ordinary in a way that will hopefully move it to be non-ordinary or non-existent. Better. Better to be non-existent. So, I want to talk a little bit about how we utilized some of that in the first Meet Me at the Stockyards event that some of us in this room were involved in. Um, I was one of the organizers, I wasn't the organizer. <laughs> there were many of us that were organizing this event for a long time, for over, over time. And you, you, you forged the circle, though. Yes. I worked to um, help forge that circle, I think, and there were many people that held that energy, and many non-human animals that hold that energy all the time, which is why we do not work. I'm going to lose my voice, sorry, I've been getting over a cold, so... <clears throat> part of the... Part of the thing I love about witchcraft is the building of community. And in the Meet Me at the Stockyards event, that's where I saw how um, activism and witchcraft and some theory can actually come together in a, a really positive way to work for change. So it kind of happened a bit spontaneously, I'd say, where we broke into ritual spontaneously <laughs> one night, one organizing night. Um, actually it first started when we were receiving our, our um, non-violent civil disobedience training with a trainer called Maggie. And it was happening at a church, ironically. <laughs> um, so that was, had all kinds of meanings for me, personally. <laughs> um, but Maggie graciously taught us, and again, you know, honoring our teachers, how, from her experience, we can utilize nonviolent civil disobedience in an action like the Meet Me at the Stockyard. Is any is anyone not familiar with the Meet Me at the Stockyards event that happened in November? Okay, so not some of us are not going, what? What was that? Um, so after our training at the church um, with Maggie, um, Paul York you know, suggested that we do some kind of a circle there. And so it was a very, I think for those of you that were in that training, it was a very interesting training in that we were accessing um, affective or emotional states because we were also simulating, we were role playing what we thought might happen um, on that day of the action. And as it turns out, some of it did. But um, it was really based on a lot of rage, anger, and how would we manage that if, if we were faced with that face-to-face. -face. 
So that naturally, I think, brings up a lot of emotion in people. And so after we work through that and, and with the help of Maggie and kind of deconstructed and debriefed that, we came together in this circle and, and it was a real, I don't even remember everything that I did or that I said, but it was a real guidance around grounding energy and around being together and around the role that solidarity plays in a political action and about knowing that about each other. So that's what we, um, to summarize, that's what we did with that first spontaneous kind of circle. And I think it was important because for the first time, I think we really shared energy with one another. And that is a basis of the craft, is learning how to work with energy. Um, one of the, a witch that I read named Dion Fortune um, said, you know, magic is the art of changing consciousness at will. And I think energy comes into that and when we can work that and utilize that collectively, then it's even stronger. And that's what I think happened with that first, on that first, the first time we did that as a group, is that there was something that sort of happened as we were in that circle with one another. Um, that was then brought into the actual, um, another meeting, a meeting I think we had at my house before the event when um, it was a larger circle where the marshals came and it was a very well organized um, event. We, you know, we, we were deliberate in our thinking of how we could work through this action and how people could remain safe and how people could walk through their fears around it. And so we were dealing with already on that emotional terrain, I think, with one another. And for me personally, I didn't know a lot of the people that were involved until I got involved, but I was so called to be involved and now I understand why. Um, so in that last meeting before our event, um, I did lead sort of a grounding, a meditation, an intention. We set intention energetically for what we envisioned this to be and do for the animals and how we could envision what we wanted to happen for those animals and for us on that day. And some of us voiced it out loud in a circle and again we shared energy but it was an intention that was so strong and willful I would say. And again in my experience that helped to build that sense of solidarity, it helped to build that arena of connectivity. So then, the day of the action, people who came to that, whether they were supporters or people who were the sitters on that day or the, the allies on that day, we held a little circle beforehand. And it was just a way of breathing together and of acknowledging where we were and of being present. And I think one of the critical things about any political action, especially if it's a civil disobedience action, is to be able to be present. Really present. Not just with your head, but your body. Um, and that is in solidarity with the non-human animal bodies that have no choice but to be present in that system. So we're in solidarity with them, and we're in solidarity with one another. So we did that before the action started. And I think as the action progressed, having done that helped us to stay sort of connected. I know for me, I was, I was so attuned <laughs> to all of the sitters because of that, and I think that was part of it. Um, fast forward to what happened and the violence that happened uh, on that day. 
not only obviously to the non-human animals, but to the sitters and to some of the supporters that were there. Um, that was hard. It was hard to stay present in that. And yet, for me, I think the ritualized aspect of that helped me to bear witness to not only what was about to happen to the animals, but what was happening to my fellow friends. And I think that to be present with compassion, to bear witness to that too. After that, when some people were carted off to the police station, we did a circle with those people that were left to try to ground some of the energy that had naturally occurred because of what we had seen together. There were tears, there was anger, there was a lot of intensity, so to try to create a container to manage that was part of what I did and others helped to do as well. And I think it's essential to movements, to social movements, to political movements, to understand how that energy works when you're in an intense situation. I want to stop there for a minute, and I want to just check in, and I want to just check in around where you're at, if you're present, and if there's anything you want to ask, or talk about it, or inquire, or just say at this point, because I've been doing a lot of talking. Amazing it felt to have real grounding energy when we were doing the action. When we were sitting down, that's the part that I do, and then you check in and make eye contact with each of us. I, I thought that was incredible. It really helped um, pull our energy down. Yeah. So, again, Jenny, what you're talking about is that, that connectivity and that with political actions that we do of any sort to have appointed people or a person or people to just be that, to be that role, I think it's critical because it also um, keeps focus where focus needs to be in a political action on people who are, especially if it's a, a non-violent Civil, if it's a civil disobedience action in particular. So, yeah, I, I felt naturally compelled to take on that role. That's not to say that someone else shouldn't. But I think there's something about knowing that that's an intention and knowing that that's your role that can help you to be of service in that moment. So. I think it's a good point and something to consider always in actions as we move forward. Any other questions or thoughts or comments? Yeah. Is the, the will and the connection, eye contact, are there other, other things that we don't? Excuse me, my quote. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, did people hold symbols or any objects that each person had that helped to keep themselves focused on mm -hmm. attention because that's something that can be used in magic. Absolutely. So I'm not sure if the indi if individuals did that on that day. I think the embracing of arms, the touching of one another um, I know what you're saying is different, and I'll speak to that in a moment. But I think that sense of bonding was um, a way of reminding that there's solidarity, there's rootedness here, there's strength here. And I think that was part of what some did. I know Jenny, you and Catherine were very close that way. 
and in looking back at footage um, at one moment when the trucks were so close to the sitters to you and to Jenny and Catherine and and you were being sort of assaulted from behind by workers and that even police I think you Paul and Paul York both sort of intuitively or maybe not intuitively but it happened had bodies over bodies to protect so I think there are these things that just naturally come up what you're talking about Helen is is important it, you know in witchcraft one of the sort of phrases we can we say when we're doing magic is you know this equals this or this symbolizes this so you can create talismans if you will um, or um, charms or whatever you want to call it that represent something and you can carry them with you as well so um, if you are infusing something a healing stone or a herb or something or an image of an animal um, infusing it with that which you hope will happen for that being or with that stone you can carry it physically on your body to represent that this equals that and it's something that you can sort of feel you know on your own and remind yourself again it's about anchoring it's about helping you stay present in the moment when there's chaotic often unbridled energy in a political action surrounding you. What Starhawk started to do strongly in the 1990s in particular, she'd always been an activist, but in the 1990s she really got involved with the anti-globalization movement and teaching activists in particular how to utilize ritual in these really large protest movements like she was at the Quebec summit, she was in Seattle, working with activists to, to understand how energy works. So what you're talking about and what we kind of did was to be able to contain energy, to be able to be so rooted with the earth that no one's going to move us. Sometimes that's the energy you want to draw on in an action. Sometimes it's fire energy, you want to burst through something. So it really depends what the intention of that action is. But having something like that, a symbol, can also be a way of working with energy and working with sort of a personal um, talisman that can help you individually as well. Yeah. Um, I wonder, are, in witchcraft, are stereotypical images, of course, uh, as probably all of us do, and some different stereotypical yeah. images, no doubt, um, are animal parts used as talismans or in casting spells or in ritual, and how, does that, how do you deal with that? Yeah. I'm curious. <laughs> um, yes, they are, in some traditions, and never would I. Um, and so, um, I think if you are claiming to be interconnected with beings and life, that it is the antithesis then to be taking life and utilizing it. I know there's cultural traditions, there's spiritual traditions, there's spiritual practices, and for me, because I'm also an animal rights activist, that is my stance on it. Um, I personally have statues of animals, I have cat fur that I've brushed off, I have whiskers, I have, you know, things that naturally kind of occur. Um, that I know there was no harm done. And that's one of the witch's sort of rules, reads as they're called. You know, do what you will and harm none. And that's consistent through many witchcraft traditions. So I, that's one of the gaps that I talked about earlier that made no sense to me, is that if we really believe, um, do what you will and harm none, then how are we being in the 
world with other people, but with non-humanities, with the earth. You know, how can we then go about and continue those practices? So it, for me, that's where I, I stand. I worked with um, a teacher in the Yorubu tradition. Um, her name is Louisa Tish, and she was one of Starhawk's kind of companions. And I learned so much around colonization, around, you know, how that tied into um, dismantling certain spiritual traditions. And I learned so much from her. And where I had to stop was around the use of human animals in ritual. It's a difference that is there in that tradition. So one of the things that um, I was taught around um, like rituals, sharing rituals, which is share rituals, you know, share. Um, to make a ritual your own, you have to change one thing. So one of the things that I always change is if, it, if there's something related to non-human animals, that goes. It's an easy change. It's an easy solve. So I believe we can have difference in that and still practice. And of course, I'm always trying to educate around the question around why, you know, and how. And if we say this, how this? So I think it's always important to, to be critical and to interrogate and to use your voice too. Well, just to just to follow up with mm -hmm. Peter's line of thinking and, and your very um, deep response, um, sometimes wonder if you know, like carnivorous habits and, and culture are so deep rooted and ubiquitous in our, in our species, really, that there's been so much loss of information, you know, from, so whatever the signal is from the, the deep witch traditions, and how, like, how, how deep do they go, thinking in terms of time, like, they could go in, in some of their roots into some pre carnist versions of our species scattered throughout the world, and and so by the time they get translated, like we see that translation, how there's a mistranslation. When I mean, we saw with the Keith Akers talk, how within, within 0.2 generations of Christianity, there's this massive distortion of a pro-animal message. And, and suddenly we just don't understand how to read all these events in the life of the founder. And, mm -hmm. and in, in, in the case of which ritual too, I mean, I, I feel I've had a couple of talismans come to me, and, and they, they come, they kind of appear, like they feel like they're given, and they're, there's a messaging in the environs that this has a certain meaning. And, and this whole idea that you grab an animal, you pull its leg off, I mean, I know that's it. <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 this seems like a really, like, degraded... I can, I can see how some versions of that will actually be a degraded... You know what? That's not right, though. I think there's a lot of anti-witch baloney out there. No, Pete, I'm, 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 you know, no, I'm saying, I'm saying, oh, no, yeah, yeah. I'll yeah. be very short. I have some friends that are, that are serious, which is like for decades, and they were vegan and vegetarian 30 years ago, and they don't push it on anybody, but they believe it from them. They believe in spirit animals, and they would never harm anyone. And that, no, but that idea of, you know, it's not just the, the read you said, there's also the one, whatever bad belief you put out comes back to you three times. There's no bad magic. That's not. That's the kind of Hollywood. Movie. The way I understand it, you correct me. But I think it's probably like any. A lot of what struck me, what you said so far, is how similar all religions are, and, and passive resistant movements like Gandhi's there or, or Martin Luther King. There's always that spiritual moment. Anyway, so I don't want to hijack your comment. I just wanted to defend. I don't think. I think that's kind of unfair to think that people are sacrificing animals. Well, I think. I think all this. You, know, you were. Focus. I think Lorraine. Lorraine was saying. They do like like that. so they're they're strains they're some, versions some right so some 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 do some do no no some some do some do, some do. Okay. Some, <laughs> some <laughs> she, she broke 
I believe lineage yeah. with with some who who were whom she otherwise respected. So I'm I'm, I'm responding to that sure. reality. Um, but I, I agree that I part of the distortion is that the versions that don't um, get get hidden right in anti woman anti witch all there kind of that, lore that, right. So like every witch in the popular consciousness is hacking up animals and boilers in the cauldron, mm -hmm. and clearly that's false. But it's it's also Mm -hmm. Important to know that there's a there's a vestige of truth in a lot of these stereotypes that that there, that this, this does go on and has to be confronted, and and I'm suggesting that that maybe some of that at least is is a reflection of the the usually still misogynist but anti animal culture that uh, the witch is is arising within and then often reacting to, so that it still it still has an anti animal stamp. And, and so, yes, there needs to be messaging from the animals in a lot of talismans, but um, the idea that you kill an animal and you take a part of it, that seems like a carnist distortion of, of uh, probably a much more powerful version of, of that connecting, mm -hmm. where you're actually connecting to the spirit world. It's like, it's like bad seduction or something, which becomes like assault. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, as opposed to making a deep connection with someone else and then, and then together. And let me, I just also, because this is also being taped, I want to be clear. Um, it wasn't that necessarily Louisa Tiche was sacrificing animals, or everyone in the Yoruba tradition sacrifices animals. Yet it is part of a tradition. And it's not the only tradition that has historically and culturally, and maybe still does, but maybe doesn't anymore. So that was my point there. The other thing I want to bring it back to, though, is it's not only about sacrificing animals. It's about, for example, Starhawk and many sort of neo-pagan movements um, looking at, again, that connection that, say, witches have with nature and that, you know, eating certain animals or um, using or, you know, the natural cycle of things um, is exactly that. It's a natural cycle, so therefore it's okay and justified. That is where I also parted ways with Starhawk. So it's not the most grotesque sacrificing. It's about legitimizing use of animals and claiming that it's natural. I would argue, as I think many here would, you know, that's almost a fallacy. Where does that even happen anymore? If you really look at the systematization of animals for food, like, yeah, sure, it might in some spaces happen, but certainly not in a space that Starhawk would be living in or teaching in. So I think that we, need, we can be critical of, of much of the neo-pagan movement which ignores or reconfigures what the non-human animal relationship is to us as practitioners and what that means to our connection and, and their connection to nature. And I think that's where I am most interested in critiquing because that's what I know and that's what I've been taught. So I think Sure, we can go into those spaces too, but let's come back to, you know, the problems with this. The problems, I love this woman, and I can test the part of her that doesn't understand the connection with women. That's what I'm interested in. And so, and again, it's not her personally, although, yeah, it kind of is, but, you know, it's about the teaching of it. And I think then, for those of us that are activists, are animal rights activists, and um, either neo-pagan, pagan witches, I believe it's our responsibility to take this up. And it's our it's responsibility to do things differently and put that out in the world. And it's good, Pete, that there are other witches that you know, and many in this room, who probably would agree about the vegan and understand that read of you know, do what you will and harm none. Who really understand that? Like it, what's not to understand them? So it's good. Yeah. Did you find a progression 
uh, between earlier generations, you mentioned Dionne Fortune, uh, between her writing and, for instance, Starhawk, in, this, in the sense of uh, awareness of, of animal issues. I mean, did you find it, did you learn anything from Dionne Fortune's writing with regard to I, animal rights? Um, maybe not so much animal rights. Or at least our relationship with animals and consciousness. I asked because I've read a little bit of hers myself yeah. and found her fascinating, but... She is fascinating, yeah. and she's fascinating in that she was contesting things based on gender from very sexist um, traditions, the Gardnerian tradition, and misogynist, I would say. Um, in terms of animal rights, I don't think I probably... But then again, when I was reading Dion Fortune, I wasn't fully there either. So I think everything is about context. And when I started with Starhawk, I was, you know, I, I was vegan, but I didn't have, I wasn't political about it. So I think it also is about where you situate yourself in history. And so I don't know that it's fair to say I didn't learn anything from her about animal rights, because I was meeting there when I was reading that. I was interested in how she rose up against and worked with the idea of gender and being sort of where women sat initially in some of those early traditions is not good, <laughs> put it mildly. Um, so she was rising up about that, and that I appreciated about her. Um, I think Starhawk in, in this book is moving differently in nature, and yet it, it isn't necessarily, it isn't an animal rights or even an animal advocate, I would say, position, yet. Is there any way we can wave a wand and just shut down all the slaughterhouses? Oh, <laughs> God, I wish. I wish. You know, I, I was often asked, you know, like... Yeah, harmers. Yeah. Animal harmers. Well, you know, there is a witch named Z. Budapest who comes from a Hungarian tradition who actually, you know, creates rituals to put hexes on things and people and, you know, justifies it and, you know, has her way around. She's a feminist. She's, um, I did a workshop with her once in California and she's a blast, but, you know, that brings up a whole bunch of issues. But it, it raises a point about what does this all mean anyway, right? And why, why witchcraft and animal rights? You know, why even talk about those two? And I, for me, really think it has to do with the, uh, what I've been talking about in terms of the emotional component of the work that we do and the emotional, and, and what happens to non-human animals and how we need to keep ourselves well and healthy to be able to continue contesting that. Um, I think that that is really significant in our movement. I really do. Because I've seen and I've felt, and I've been to the despondent places, and I've been to the hopeless places because of the treatment of non human animals. I know I've gone there, and I know many of us go there. And so, what tools do we have then to help each other come back up, go back out, and continue? And that's where I think the real intersection can happen and is really important. So, there's a theoretical component which we could get into, but I'm more interested in the affective component. So, in just drawing this part to a close, um, I'm always interested in the notion of hope. And some days I think, ah, there isn't any. <laughs> and then other days I think, no, there has to be. And so, I like to... I find, I, I'm finishing an undergrad degree right now too in Women and Gender Studies and I find that I'm always drawn to areas around utopian visions and, you know, how does that blend with activist realities and, you know, can we work those too? Because I'm seeking that. And so, there is, um, where is it now? Interestingly enough, <laughs> I'm taking this course now called um, Youth, Gender, and Civil Society. And this is our book, our text is called Rebel Girls, and it's about youth activism. And there's a whole section on hope. 
<laughs> and within the context of social movements and within the context of young women. So I'm drawing a lot around politics and the idea of hope. And I just want to find this piece here. So the author is Jessica Taft. And she talks about utopia, uh, not as a place we might reach, but an ongoing process of becoming. Um, and I like that. She also says, um, Um, treating utopian ideals as touchstones for inspiring and guiding one's political projects acknowledges the complexity and unpredictability of social change. In this way, it is a utopianism that is satisfied with not having arrived, one that continues to strive toward that elsewhere and otherwise. Hope, then, is especially vital to a utopianism that accepts the open-ended quality of history and social change, but believes in the positive possibilities. In this kind of vision, a better world is not inevitable or guaranteed, but it is worth imagining, hoping for, talking about, and acting to create. So I believe that utopia, or the idea of hope, is a place we can reach. And part of what can be done in a ritual environment is to envision. And so when I worked in Circle or in Coven, um, part of what we often do is release. And that's done in many ways, and I can talk about that individually with you if you like. Um, but we also then need to replace what we let go of with something else. So what is that? So to me, that's the vision. To me, that's the hope. To me, that's the utopia. What is it that we envision? And I think the idea, or the, even the word utopia, um, just like animal rights or animal liberation, it gets dismissed. And it's like, no, my, I contend that we need to reclaim that. We need to bring that back as possibility. And we need to talk about what that utopia looks like for non-human animals in our social movement. And that gives us, then, a way to move forward. It gives us that vision to focus on. It gives us the energy to focus on. And it gives us that emotional, affective place to cut through the misery that we walk through. So I'm all about waving a magic wand. <laughs> and I think there are ways that we can work with that idea and utilize that idea. And we can utilize that in how we do ritual in public and put to shame those that discount it. I think it's an I think it's important I think it's it's so important that it helps us be well in this moment. I just want to, I have no idea what time it is in that half, because <laughs> time is 8.25, excellent. I want to sort of end this part of things with, um, has anyone ever read Susan Griffin or know Susan Griffin? <clears throat> Another book that I got in the 80s, I'm dating myself. <laughs> um, she is an eco-feminist, and she's in, she was sort of dabbling in the, the, the goddess religions and, you know, the Merlin Stone kind of history of goddesses. And, and she's very poetic and she's very political. Um, she gets taken up a lot by feminists because, again, it's that um, conundrum of the, the connection between women and nature and what that means and how we need to be careful that it doesn't fall into essentializing women and relegating to always be the caretakers and, you know, the, the ones who are only emotional. I think that does a disservice to us. Um, but her right and not but, her writing is beautiful in this book. It's a, it's a retelling of the story. She goes to that place of misery and comes out of it. So I really recommend this for, for many reasons. So, 
my original book I had totally fell apart, all the pages fell out. So I had Joanne MacArthur bought me, found this and bought me this one. Thank you, Joanne. So I want to end with this. It's called This Earth, What She Is to Me. As I go into her, she pierces my heart. As I penetrate further, she unveils me. When I have reached her center, I am weeping openly. I have known her all my life, yet she reveals stories to me, and these stories are revelations, and I am transformed. Each time I go to her, I am born like this. Her renewal washes over me endlessly. Her wounds caress me. I become aware of all that has come between us, of the noise between us, the blindness, of something sleeping between us. Now my body reaches out to her. They speak effortlessly, and I learn at no instant does she fail me in her presence. She is as delicate as I am. I know her sentience. I feel her pain, and my own pain comes into me, and my own pain grows large, and I grasp this pain with my hand. And I open my mouth to this pain I taste, I know, and I know why she goes on, under great weight, with this great thirst, in drought, in starvation, with intelligence in every act does she survive disaster. This earth is my sister. I love her daily grace, her silent daring, and how loved I am. How we admire this strength in each other, all that we have lost, all that we have suffered, all that we know, we are stunned by this beauty. And I do not forget what she is to me and what I am to her. Thanks for listening. And I'm open to answer questions and to get interactive. Uh, it's quite a while ago that, that uh, Paul York mentioned this to me, and I think it was in the context of a meeting. It's a while ago, and I don't remember the, 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 what he was referring to, but he did mention in a, with a humorous uh, expression that he thought that a curse or a hex against a slaughterhouse might be a good thing to do. And, uh, and I think he might have even done one. I think he might have even done one with a couple. Yeah, more than one. And, uh, and of course, we know that quality meat packers went bankrupt or closed down. I wonder if that was one of the curses he left. <laughs> Do you know anything about curses and hexes and efficacy and, and the ethics thereof? Yeah. So when I referred earlier to Z Budapest, the Hungarian witch, um, while I was kind of making light of the idea of hexing, I'm not meaning to. And in her book, she talks about um, the ethics of working magic against abusers and <clears throat> I think that there is a place for that. Um, I think we have to look carefully at how power is constructed and how we talk about power and is it, um, it's going to get stuck in my teeth if I eat it right now so I'm going to pass it right now but I will have some later. Um, if we are working around dismantling systems, then I think absolutely we can and ought to work with whatever tools we have available to us. I think it gets a bit tricky if we are targeting a person, even though she does. Um, because I wonder about that which you have said, which is another sort of read, what you put out returns to you tenfold. And <laughs> I'm quite scared of that, actually. Yeah, I've seen it happen. Yeah, that's what Kim was saying. It's the same yeah. thing. You would never, uh, she's yeah. saying people like that are what they call Bollywood witches, and they don't practice in a coven. It's a very yeah. private, personal thing. Exactly. And they would always remind me that it's like the oldest religion, and all these other religions stole from it. Mm -hmm. You know, from mm -hmm. the beginning. So I think, however, we can utilize that if we're looking at systems, because we have created these systems. We have created these oppressive systems. So I think that there's something to that. And I was involved in um, that uh, 
commemoration. I think probably many here that Paul York led around animal testing, around through the section. Bridges. Right? Bridges. Bridges. And there was, you know, sort of something that he nailed onto, <laughs> um, you know, the wall, and you know, there was some hexing going on there, I'd say. And even though it was kind of done in maybe not the most. Um, There's Santeria and voodoo and all those kind of traditions. You see that in South America. Mm -hmm. People light cigars and put yeah. things in the middle of the road or some sort yeah. of stuff. There, like there's that. many traditions of it. Uh, um, so just coming back to this one, I, I think it was done sort of almost humorously, and yet there was a there was a specific intention there around what was happening. So again, I think there's different ways that we can work energy. But always we have to be mindful of the power. And Starhawk, in her actually in her first book, Dreaming the Dark, which was her PhD thesis really looks at the issue of power and, and you know, power over versus power with. Uh, um, so we need to be conscious of what we're constructing and how we're constructing it in order to, to utilize them. I have a question for you. I don't know if it's because of a fan or if you're, you can't explain it, but when you're saying you can channel this energy to you to uh, sort of recharge your batteries when grief is too much, that kind of like, how you do that just by changing perspective. Like, did I miss it? Did you explain? Because no, I didn't. Because there's so many. Change your focus or something. Yeah. I'm, um, I don't think there's one easy right answer to that. And for those of you in the room who practice, know that um, if we're constructing a healing ritual or um, some kind of ceremony that there's different elements that go into it and that it's it can be as simple or as complex as need be for that particular moment. So um, I'm reluctant to kind of, for the same reason that there's sort of pop witchcraft books out there, I'm reluctant to sort of say this is all you need right. to do because it's a much deeper and yet it there are ways to work with emotions I also want to say that I'm not suggesting that all we feel is pain and anger and rage we also feel great joy 